Ira Herbs, and this is and Andrea Heberkamp, and I am the Vice President of Political and Legislative Action at AFT Oregon, and uh, quite recently we were fortunate enough to hire Andrea, and we'll let her talk about uh, all the work that she does, but that could take the entire time we have here, so hopefully she'll just give you a small overview. Yeah, just, uh, just to introduce myself, um, I was in CGE, Local 6069, for about five years. Then I was an external organizer for a bit at, uh, in Washington State. Now I'm back at AFT Oregon um, helping out with political organizing and excited to talk about what it is. And, and my quick bio was that I was involved in politics in Los Angeles. I was a government teacher. Uh, I've been kind of a political wonk starting back in the Vietnam War days when I realized that if you get enough people together and make enough noise, people will hear you. And it sort of informed my, my life since then. Uh, I was uh, VP of Plaque at uh, my local FFAP, and now I get to do the fun stuff here. So we would like to get into our presentation. Uh, all right, so just an overview of what we're going to cover in uh, an hour and five minutes with that uh, noon people ready for a hot lunch. Um, you know, we're going to talk about what political organizing is. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that AFT Oregon does at state and at local levels. There's so many locals doing really cool things. I just wanted to highlight a little bit here. We're going to talk about some opportunities that we have here um, for folks to get involved, both with Oregon Labor Candidate School and uh, your union's own folks who are at LERF, the Labor Education and Research Center, uh, and Mark Brenner is going to be able to talk a little bit about that. We'll have time for Q&A in the middle too, so if folks after presenting have some questions. Uh, we're, then we're going to have folks break out per either your local or locals that are close to you like geographically to brainstorm about some next steps that everyone can take um, out of here and then wrap up. All right. So this is one of my favorite pictures. This is uh, Portland during the George Floyd and the uh, Black Lives Matter and he fund protests this summer. Um, this did not happen entirely spontaneously, right? There's a lot of organizing that went into making this happen. How many people have heard the phrase that the personal is political and the political is personal? Yeah, what, what is not in that sentence is organizing because each of us as individual persons with our individual issues cannot necessarily create the change we need to see. That is why we are labor union members. That's why we are organizers because we know that just personal like persons themselves don't create change it takes strength in numbers and it takes actions to then make uh those political changes happen that affect us personally and so we also know further that as educators and people in education workplaces that our workplaces and our lives are increasingly a part of what is a multifaceted um crisis, right? Both in terms of the reality with staffing and wages and needing to fight for uh, conditions and equity in our work, but also uh, political parties, <laughs> political hacks, uh, turning their, 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 their fingers at uh, unions, education unions, and education workers. We know workers are involved in a variety of, of arenas. Right, unions are even pressuring parties. Uh, so whether it's issues or whether pressuring parties or in the halls of the legislature, um, we cannot avoid really the fight and the need to be politically organizing. And so some concepts to think about how political organizing can take shape. It's that like we're whole people and as we discussed, our individual issues do become collective issues through our solidarity and our organizing. We organize everywhere we are in order to take power and make a better world, whether that's in our workplace, in our community, and in uh, whatever you call political, right? Like it, there's a lot of overlap between all of these. But in all of these, again, our real strength is in numbers 
and in our ability to take collective action. And what this organizing does, much like workplace organizing, gets people to take you know, their anger, their frustration, and then it channel it through action and, and, um, and, and building that worker power. Political organizing will move people to connect those personal experiences to political movements and political solutions that you either create yourself, find coalition with, or are working towards. Um, and I'll be emailing some articles that delve deeper into some of these concepts if you find these kind of interesting. But uh, right what we're organizing for, especially as folks in labor, we know that we need power, right? And so shifting power towards the working class is often forms of political solutions and political movements, such as uh, getting the right folks in office or expanding voting rights or adding people to boards of trustees who could vote and be members of our union. Um, and creating policy feedback loops that address issues ahead or outside the bargaining table. You also have healthcare for all out there, right? Like that would then make healthcare not the pressing uh, bargaining issue quite like it is now, thus freeing up our capacity and our ability to organize for more in the workplace. Is this on your slide yet? All right, so real quick before I pass it over to Ira, um, there's kind of four pillars that, that Ira and I thought about in political organizing, and each of them have some metrics, right? Because if you organize and you don't really have a metric to attach to it, how do you know if you're winning or not? <laughs> you know, So some of it is really simple, legislation. Did it pass or not? Um, you know, That was really the metric for years on part-time faculty healthcare, with the, which AFP Oregon has spent over a decade and has won really big the past few years on. We can really gauge that metric, passing, electoral as well. You either win the election or you don't. But it's also about building some of the relationships that we have. Um, and in social justice, there's many different ways to assess this as it, you know, bringing attention and engagement, mobilization, or mutual aid, the transfer of, of, of power and resources between folks to help redress community and social issues. And then as well as the community profile, the ability for people to say jobs with justice or DSA labor or this union or that organization has a positive reputation from doing great work and making those wins happen. I'm gonna hop it over to Ira now. Okay, so as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm the uh, VP of Political and Legislative Action. And I know that some locals are concerned about being involved in the political arena. And what I say to them and what I will say to you is that you have two options. You are either at the table or you are on the menu, okay? So if you want to control what is being discussed, you should have a seat at the table. Now, what does that involve? There's lots of different ways and through the course of the next 35 minutes or so, we will provide you with some ideas and then ask you to think about ways of your own. But simply, you could start with endorsing healthcare for all. That could be your political action, okay? So it depends on your capacity. Some of you are small locals, okay? I get that, so it's easier to get together and discuss everything, all right. What I'd like to tell you is, is that you are invited to, to participate in the plaque meetings. We make endorsements. We had 35 or 40 endorsements that we worked through, looking at questionnaires, reviewing the uh, voting history of sitting uh, candidates, interviewing folks when we could. We spent, uh, I guess there's about an hour of my life I'll never get back talking through Bias Reed the other day, but we have a chance to do the hard work for you all, okay? We also have an opportunity to reward candidates that have voting records that support us. And of course, that reward is, as the Supreme Court has shown, free speech is money, money is free speech. So we make sure they know that we support what they're doing. But if you wanna listen in, if you wanna participate, it's a lot easier now. COVID has made members showing up and even my own committee people showing up to meetings a lot easier, okay? So even if we go back live, we will still be doing hybrid uh, 
committee meetings. Okay, I know Chloe has asked, as a former plaque member, has asked to participate. And so you can ask, I mean, there may be some meetings where we're sort of in our own closed session, but people will want to know what we do because you're thinking about starting your own local plaque or you just want to know what the hell we're doing. It's open, it's not in secrecy, okay? So I talked about being at, at the table or on the menu. So here I am meeting with uh, Marty Walsh, the Secretary of Labor. I had an opportunity to sit in a room with AFT affiliate leaders, um, Congressperson Bonamici and Blumenauer, and my new buddy Marty here, all right? So I had access to the folks that make decisions, all right? Here is our group at the AFL-CIO convention with the interloper, Mark Brenner, which we'll talk to you a little bit later. Tie me with, sorry? I know you are. I know you are, Mark, and we appreciate you. No, no die. Okay, here's Jaime talking to other candidates. So it gives us opportunity. They come to us now. We don't need to hunt them down. Okay. All right. Uh, is you or me? Um, <laughs> Uh, sure. So, um, Andrea talked about metrics. All right. We got behind some legislation uh, that would benefit not only our members, but AFT Oregon takes our social footprint very seriously. We, can, we are concerned about our fellow workers and the fellow citizens and our environment. We take the old adage, an injury to one is an injury to all, as our marching orders. Okay, after a mere 13 years, we got healthcare for part-time passed. Okay. And then if you'll pardon my language, we came back and cleaned up the clusterfuck of what that was. All right, so hopefully it'll be a lot easier for part-time folks to qualify for that healthcare. All right, we are working on loan, getting the uh, loan forgiveness for, for uh, public employees. Federal government's working on it, We've done it, okay? Uh, big one for us is we managed to help get uh, overtime pay for farm workers passed, okay? This is huge. There are still states where farm workers do not even work for minimum wage, the federal minimum wage. This is vestiges of Jim Crow, okay? So we're able to come that. One thing that we are working on right now is the Treasury Transparency Bill. We would like to know where our peers Peers do dollars are being invested. PERS is invested heavily in fossil fuel industries. They're invested in uh, money uh, groups that are buying up property and making it difficult for folks to afford housing. They're using that money to be involved in clandestine kinds of software operations that literally strip all the information off your phones. And that information was used to break the teachers union in Mexico. So we want our treasurer to say to us at least once a year, this is how we are investing your money. And so that we can have some input and say, hey, we don't want our money invested that way. Or maybe we do, but we should have a say in that. Okay. So looking ahead, we're trying to deal with the university boards. Uh, they used to have a single entity that sat over all of them. OHSU wanted to make more money. And so they managed to get that split off. And all of you know, you're dealing with, I, there are no polite words. You're dealing with the folks that are running your universities and your colleges that need some oversight. There are no adults in the room and they really need somebody to hold them accountable. Yeah. We're also working on trying to get part-time equity pay with full-time. Yeah. I know some folks are working at, at colleges where part-time folks you know, you're, you're, we have folks at PCC that are living in their car and they're driving over to McDonald's to have Wi-Fi in order to teach their classes and adjuncts. Completely, completely unacceptable. All right. Uh, and then we're also working with K through 12 folks. Uh, there are people in K through 12 and also other industries, but specifically in K through 12 that are working 3.9 hours because at four hours they get part-time health care. Okay, and they specifically, yeah, you have a job, 3.9 hours, you want it? So they're making less than 16 bucks an hour and they have no access to healthcare. So these are the kinds of things that we are fighting for. Thank you, Dr. 
Thank you. And these are the kinds of things, thank you. And these are the kinds of things your locals can get behind. Again, you don't have to be doing the endorsements. You don't have to do the interviews, the candidates. But you can look at a single issue and get your folks to lobby your legislators. Get your local legislators to know who you are and who you represent. Okay? We have a candidate survey that we send out. Uh, it's onerous. We managed to whittle it down to 12 pages. Uh, some of my friends are candidates and they just give me a WTF and they said, hey man, we cut four pages out of it. What do you want? All right, but we wanna know where they stand on a wide range of issues. Okay, we also, thanks to Andrea, have a more organized way of tracking when the questionnaires have gone out, when they've come back in, okay? It allows us to then follow up and say, hey, you need your questionnaire by X date because we're making our decision processes, okay? Uh, we have this exemplar for Bully, uh, Bureau of Labor and Industries. We're only one of four states where we get to elect our Bully, and Andrea will talk a little bit more about how you can be involved with this in a few hours. Okay, next please. All right, this is another example of what AFT Oregon has been working to accomplish. There are three other AFT affiliates in the state of Oregon. They are nationally affiliated, so they're not part of AFT Oregon. But we have OFNHP, uh, the nurses in Tex at Kaiser, uh, ONA, Oregon Nurses Association, OSCA, the support staff in our schools, and of course, AFT Oregon. This was the first time the four of us figured out how to play well together. Okay, and we uh, organized a uh, congressional candidate forum for congressional districts four, five, and six. And we met and discussed our endorsements. Together we represent more than 56,000 working union members in the state of Oregon. We are a lot more powerful together. And we are in conversation on an almost monthly basis now trying to figure out where we have commonality. We're gonna be sending out questionnaires to our members, and then we're gonna be looking at those questions, all those answers and go, hey, we line up here, we line up here. We can work together to make sure that happens in the legislature. So this is, this is unprecedented. And I have to give a shout out to Will, our, our uh, wonderful communications uh, man in the back of this great traffic. Commissioner Wright, like, um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but but next Saturday, if you are in the Portland area or not in the Portland area, even not, right, like, we will help. Fuel costs should no be a, not be a burden, but we really have to knock on doors to make sure we get a labor commissioner elected. This is all part of, like, what we're working on as a state federation and in coalition with folks, because as Ira mentioned, we are one of only four states that elects the labor commissioner role. And there is some Kroger money, some hospital administrators money in their pack, real estate companies. I'm seeing the campaign financing on the other side of some of these candidates. There's a lot of people, a lot of our bosses in this room who would love for someone else to be elected labor commissioner. And AFL-CIO, our union has gotten to meet with her. I've gotten to meet her a number of times because I'm out there every weekend for my own time knocking on doors because it, if, that, if there's a candidate to rally behind, um, I'm telling you as someone who's usually pretty disillusioned from the political process, right? Um, I think the labor commissioner, is a, it's a wonky and a nerdy enough spot that if organized labor just like puts our back behind it, we can really keep it a pro-labor spot. So I'll have more information on to you later about that, but that's just another thing we're working on um, in this primary that ballot could do soon. Um, and I want to highlight some of the great work. How many folks from PCC FFAP are in here? Woo! Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. So many folks. You all are doing some great work, and you're building like you're building a lot of uh, of power. I mean, you could probably speak to it better than I can. But I, I just put up here some quick stuff that I've been seeing you all do, um, like independently, like endorsing in local elections and in county elections. Um, signing on to the Remar Recall Mark Shule campaign, which I know you also know a lot about as someone who's 
it's in uh, Clackamas County, Clackamas, Clackamas City. Um, you know, your political team has been organizing phone banking, postcard writing, setting up mailers, um, right, and put together a whole slide of folks that uh, you have interviewed and had questionnaires um, and getting out the vote. So, right, if your local wants to focus on local races, that is something that I think PCCSSA team is doing a lot of uh, that could be a cool template to, to learn from. Oh, yeah. You can go back one, Don. So this is, again, a, a lot of local work, but then your local can ask the state to co-endorse. All right? So we can then, so we have co-endorsed, endorsed, endorsed uh, Lita Ford, uh, Catherine McMullen, uh, Sonia Fisher, uh, I think Lynn Patterson, uh, a couple of other folks that are up there. So that means that they can run the statewide logo on their ads, plus we also then make some kind of financial contribution to support their campaigns, all right? Want you to keep thinking in your mind, does my local have the capacity? You know, there are wonks among your membership. We don't walk alone, all right? I'm on the plaque at FFAP, my local, okay? We have folks that are rank and file that participate because they actually love to be involved politically. Give them an opportunity to become active members. It's a great way to engage your members, okay? Great. And then uh, another shout out, you know, to some, and I'm, these are all just like the recent things. There's years of work folks have been doing, but PSUFA, uh, as another example of what locals can do and what you all can work on, uh, they, worked uh, like AAUP, the, the, the full-time faculty union was there, SEAU was there, student ASA, OSA was there, GEU was there as well. Um, so two AFP Oregon locals uh, worked on the Debt Collective Day of Action. They brought out folks. Their state senator came and spoke about the importance of debt forgiveness. And this was coordinated nationally, right? So talking about not doing things alone. Um, the next day, it was either the next day or the day later, by the end of the week, the can was kicked on student loan payments down the road. Uh, and that's a win, right? Like people are calling and people are organizing. And it's important to, to know when things, uh, yeah, it's important to, to, to come together on, on issue campaigns and on legislation campaigns, even on the local level. Um, are also working on political education, which is something important locals can do too. Um, there was a labor and lit event. Uh, I know uh, Erica got to help lead at PSUFA, and their first book, Work Won't Love You Back, May event, tentatively class struggle unionism by Joe Burns, but some ways that we can see our labor struggle and political struggle as inherently entwined. Let me jump in here too, please. Yeah, yeah. So another way to find out who amongst you are wonks is to invite your members to a book club, okay? <laughs> Uh, you have an investment in buying the books. That's true. Some of them are at the public library. Uh, Joe Burns's book is very well known. Uh, we have the one of the authors of this very fine book in the room, and Mark will be talking in a little while, uh, Secrets of a Successful Organizer. If you have an opportunity to go to any of these trainings, a lot of them are put on by Portland DSA, but they're also put on around the state. Well worth your time. You will not. Those are hours well spent. Okay, another really interesting book is uh, Everything, Privatization of Everything. There's another book of a similar uh, notion called Democracy in Chains. If you want to get an understanding of how the Koch brothers bought our government, and they did, you can follow the history following the end of FDR's uh, uh, time in office where there was a concerted effort to create right-wing think tanks and give them some prestige. And so the media goes to them as if any of them know anything, okay? So a, a Democracy in Chains and the Privatization of Everything are really good books. They're very accessible. And again, it's a great way to, if you say to your members, we're gonna have a book club, please come participate. It's a great way to find them, folks. 100%. And if it's on Zoom, right? Like we can start to build and collaborate and have, if your local is putting on a political uh, education book club or workshop, we could throw it in the newsletter and get even more people to show up, right? There are 17,000 folks 
that we could potentially start plugging in into popular mass education online and mass popular education and training uh, programs. Um, and then next one. And then also just uh, while I was scouring what the locals are up to, I see UA OSU doing whether or not you realize it is political education, some really, really critical conversations happening around anti-racist activism and um, also on taxes and militarism. Um, and these are all, you know, just like March and April. So UA OSU is doing a lot of really incredible work helping build that educational capacity and foundation for their members politically. Um, and then you're going to talk about barriers next. Right. <clears throat> so there's things you can do as an individual. This, this cap is my brand. All right. I walk the line of a lot of fellow unions in the area. And then I come and meet people from those unions and they go, oh, you're that education guy with the engineer hat, right? And so people then know who I am and it gives me an opportunity to then speak with them after the fact. When the bakers were on strike, I had an hour. I got in my car, drove up there, walked the line with them for an hour. If you've ever been on strike, how many of you have ever been on strike line? Okay, you know how freaking important it is and what a lift it is to have people from other unions and folks from the community come out and walk with you. Okay, uh, the local bakers did not want to sign that contract. They had an amazing amount of local support. They finally agreed to it. Okay, so that's another thing that you can do, or you can get a couple of your members and say, hey, I'm going to go up and support that action. There was a informational picket at Providence St. V. 800 people from the metro Portland area showed up to support the nurses. And I will puff up my chest as a small, as a large uh, statement that my son is an organizer and he organized that stuff. Did a heck of a job. So, barriers. On our next slide. I know that when I talk to locals, they keep thinking, man, you know, I can't do that. We have a lot of our members that don't want politics. Okay. I met with um, OHSU and their group. One of their professors finally came out and said that he's a libertarian, like he was challenging me. And I said, hey, that's awesome. I love all the voices in the room. You guys need to decide locally where you're going to start. Where are your actions? And at the end of our conversation, he goes, man, I really appreciate your frankness. I really appreciate you being here. Engage. Make sure everyone feels that they have a place, okay? So there's a lot, of, a lot of concern about that. There's a lot of concern about taking strong action, strong positions. I've spoken to presidents of other college unions, and they're like, man, you know, we don't really want to rock the boat. Hell, rock the boat, okay? Navigating the political the spec views of membership, as I said, engage them, make sure they're invited. Just don't let them control the narrative. Okay, fear of administration or community backlash. In a lot of cases, the community already don't like you. We have folks out in Eastern Oregon, they're viewed as the overpaid intellectuals in, in the community, okay? Why not engage? If you start talking to people, it helps break down their preconceived, often erroneous opinions. It's really important to be out there. Where do you begin? up to your local. I've already given you some ideas. Okay, start thinking about where's your starting point? Where's the point where you can get out there? And again, doesn't have to be a huge, giant, complex organization, all right? Um, will you get support from AFT Oregon? Hell yeah. You want me to come talk to your group? I will be there, either on Zoom or in person. I've already helped folks at uh, PSU and OS, OSU start to develop a political action committee, all right? You don't have to invent the wheel. Andrea and I will be out there. Will can be there to video your actions so that there's a documentation. If you're doing anything, invite your local electeds to come participate. They want to be in the news, all right? Yeah, and just like the potential that of the House, Dan Rayfield, who is the representative for the Corvallis area, is going to hopefully find, uh, is ready to meet. He just got to find that time.
time that's been developed, right? Like, like now let's find the time to meet with member of CGE local 6069's bargaining team as we're in some tough negotiations right now. But that's a time to like get the Speaker of the House who is right there in Corvallis to hear your issues and then make it an organizing act. Will you say you support our bargaining team? Um, <laughs> okay, did we go too long? Oregon State University is listening. They're trying to. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So and we are there to support and add to that capacity. Yes, we already have a lot of documentation. We have a lot of ways of what we did wrong and what you can do right. Figure out what your capacity is. I said, if it's a book club, that's where your starting point is. Hey, that's great. That's more political engagement than you had before you started that. If it's finding a candidate that is willing to participate and support you in your communities, you can do that. If it's healthcare for all, if it's supporting I-35, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, they're trying to um, get rid of the, that's a liquor store one? I'm a little confused here. Okay, so they want to, like in Washington, get rid of state-owned liquor stores. We have a lot of union workers that are involved in the warehousing and transportation of alcohol. A lot of mom and pop stores run these liquor stores. The, the big chains want to come in in Washington. They thought, well, greater access to booze, it'll be cheaper because it won't be taxed. Well, the, st the state added a 25% excise tax. So the prices never went down. Okay. Um, you're finding ways to involve your members is what this is about. We talked a little bit about what your local can do. Um, get involved in social justice initiatives, steering committees, the political education, the right kind, the, the well, name them, the ruling class, like the, the dominant forces that, that have power over our lives, do a lot of political education for us. And it's us as a working class and as labor unions, we not do political education that centers our material conditions and our workplaces. Uh, no one's going to do it for us. So the right kind, solidarity actions, rallies, strike funds, working in coalition with other groups um, is one the sample. Okay. Yeah, I think we're in a, yes, good. So if you're wondering, well, how the hell do I learn to do any of this here stuff? Well, we have a couple of great opportunities. One of them is through the Labor Education and Research Center in Eugene and in Portland. Uh, if you're deciding that you want to find out what it's like to become a candidate, the uh, Oregon Labor Candidate School is an amazing way to get those resources. I interview a lot of candidates and we say, what kind of training have you had? Well, I just thought I should take care of this one issue and so I'm running for office and their campaigns look like that. The folks that have more organization and more of an understanding of the greater picture of how to get elected have been through a training. Are we bringing Mark up? I'm gonna bring Mark up now. Yeah. Mark. Sure. So Mark is the director of LERC? Co-director. Co-director. Okay. You should never mind. And so we're gonna he's gonna talk a little bit about how what they offer relates to the political process, but it's also got all kinds of great organization and other kinds of training. All right. Uh so again, thank you both uh, for having me. My name is Mark Brenner, uh AFT 3209, UAUO, uh faculty, uh Union at the University of Oregon. I work on the Portland campus. So um, for those of you who are in the Portland area, easy access to the, the training and education that LERC does. I wanted to start by asking a question. How many folks in the room have either knocked doors or phone banked for a candidate? Oh, wow. Almost everybody. So let me call on you. Uh, how did you get involved in that? Uh, through, uh, maybe through, through our, our union, I think. Okay. And did you just see a, a, a flyer? Did you like get an email? Like. Uh, Probably. Okay, what about over here? Someone in this row. Yeah. Well, actually, organized a lot. Okay. And um, somebody else who uh, raised your hand, do you remember what it felt like that first door that you knocked on? Anybody willing to share what it was like the very first time you went out? Okay. Chloe. Well, I think it was first with Paul Evans. And unfortunately, the place that I went to was a neighborhood that had decided they did not want any soliciting. And they counted political or canvassing as soliciting, which is not true. Mm -hmm. It's not really something. But um, 
I was kind of terrified because I had this kind of rather unpleasant response. But then it was so funny after that, it was like the complete opposite. Oh, yeah, I want to know more. So it's, it can be a little bit daunting, but it's, it gets easier. Right. The reason I ask both how many folks have done this and what your experience was like is because for most of us who've ever done anything through our union, the first time we did it, we both were a little unclear. Okay, how's this gonna go? What's this, what's this gonna look like? And probably also a little bit intimidated and afraid. Uh, like, mm, I don't know if I'm gonna be any good at this. You know, what am I gonna say when that person opens the door? God, please don't let them open the door. I'll just leave the little flyer here. You know, everybody's been there, right? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, the reason I wanna bring that up is because just like when it comes to talking to a new employee about why the union matters, or talking to your coworkers about why we're gonna to need to turn out for the school board meeting uh, or the board of trustees meeting if we're in a tough contract negotiation, why people need to show up at bargaining to help, uh, to help us actually make sure that we can move management and win a stronger contract. Uh, changing the balance of power in the political arena is an organizing project. I come from a school that believes that there's really two kinds of power. There's organized money and there's organized people, right? And which one, let me let you guess, are we trying to mobilize, right? <laughs> but, but our power is only potential power if we're not organized. And so uh, at the Labor Center, one of the things that we really uh, want to try and do is to help you and your locals figure out how to maximize the power of organized people in the political arena. The second thing that I really wanted to let, leave you with uh, about the work that we do at the Labor Center, and I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the concrete things that we can help your local do, is that we also come from a school of thought that political organizing is not something that you do every two years or every four years. This is something that is integrally involved in your day-to-day -day union organizing and can really expand your capacity, not just to change laws and legislation or move a ballot measure, but also to change the balance of forces at your bargaining table, in your day-to-day -day actions. How many folks like have done what uh, Andrea was just talking about, bringing a, pol a, pol a politician to your bargaining or having them weigh in on a contract negotiation? Anybody done that? Yeah, it actually shifts the balance of forces. Uh, I worked for the union in California once where they would regularly bring legislators to the work site. These were cafeteria workers at the University of California. You cannot imagine how freaked out the supervisor in the, in the student union cafeteria at the University of California <laughs> Berkeley is when like the, the state rep or a House of Representatives member walks into the cafeteria like back behind the counter and starts talking to people like, what, how's it going with your job? It looks like you guys are a little busy there, a little short staff. Like, <laughs> they're not gonna tell them to go away. They're definitely not gonna like get up in their business. It changes the balance of, and needless to say, you will get some high level people down on the shop floor right away. Uh, it's being like, whoa, what's going on here? So um, political organizing is a way to expand our capacity to really build the, you know, on the power of organized people that we have in the workplace and uh, build our leverage uh, at the work site. Um, ultimately, all of it comes back to the basics of organizing, right? Inspiring your coworkers to take action, bringing people together, uh, uh, building the unity uh, around a plan that is needed to win. And so at LERC, that is what we really focus on, how to help you develop those skills individually, how to help develop those skills uh, among your membership, whether it's about um, the nuts and bolts of political organizing on uh, electoral campaigns. We're running a whole track at this year's summer school around um, campaign organizing and working on electoral campaigns for candidates. There is a flyer in your bag. With and I've got extras, so I'll pass them around when I'm done talking. Um, whether you're organizing around issue campaigns and ballot measures, um, just some of the real um, basics of how to have an organizing conversation with your coworkers about why politics matter. Uh, we were running a class on that. Uh, public speaking, the actual sort of uh, making the case, how to build uh, alliances with your uh, community, potential existing or potential community allies. Um, as Iris said, in a lot of cases, uh, people look at us as part of the problem. Oh, like my tax dollars are paying for your like exorbitant PERS. I don't even have a pension. Why the hell should I pay for your PERS? You know, so how do we flip the script on that? Like we, uh, 
we can build really powerful coalitions with the people that we serve and the communities that we serve. Uh, we have uh, a lot of education and training we can do around how to do that. Um, and uh, last but not least, the really basic, right? How do you have an organizing conversation, whether it's with one of your members about getting them involved, with somebody at the doors about why this issue matters uh, and why they should register to vote or get out and vote for a particular candidate or a particular issue. And um, so uh, it, it all comes back to sort of the secrets of successful organizing, as Ira said. And I really, um, I encourage you, we're back in person, just like spring training at the summer school for LERC. I'll pass these out. So you got them at hand. Not um, a worthwhile, I, I attended a couple of years ago down at the Yale. Uh, definitely a worthwhile okay. experience. Okay. Which is why I have Mark's Make some more, bring them to your locals. Is it great to take this okay. training and then yeah. get the 102 at, at all of those great events? And in addition to summer school, I will say, if you ever have an interest in bringing any of these trainings, obviously I have a lot of resources uh, through AFT Oregon, but we're also I, uh, a sister resource that you should feel free to tap. Happy to come to any of your locals and do uh, this kind of organizing training. Um, so think of it, if you're running for office, labor candidate school, if you wanna run for office, or you're thinking about becoming a, 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 a candidate for office, the labor candidate school is where you go. If you're thinking about how to build uh, political organizing capacity inside your local, AFT Oregon and Lurk are where you go. So thank you for a little bit of time to do some PSAs and uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I also wanted to point out that you as individuals are citizens. And so if your, if your plaque doesn't endorse a candidate that you think should have been the person they endorsed, vote for them, speak for them, work for them. You just can't do it in the name of your local because they've endorsed someone else. Okay, but don't forget about that fact that you have the right to vote and choose the, the issues as you choose to do so. All right. I go places and I represent AFT Oregon. I go places and I am a person who works at AFT and these are the things that I believe. Okay, so don't lose track of the fact that you can support the issues that you personally believe are the ones that you should support. Are we ready to have so, a question mark? Well, yeah, we, we have, uh, our time got scrunched by about 10 minutes. We did have some more time for a mid presentation Q and A, but if, if there's any urgent questions, you know, definitely raise, or we can go straight to activities breaking out by your locals or region to brainstorm on some of the barriers and opportunities that we just talked about. Um, activity, Q&A, any, any burning questions? Otherwise, we're going to... I have a question, but I can also hold it. No, go ahead. You should ask it. Um, I, uh, so I'm here with PSU FA, and um, we've been talking about endorsements has been a topic of conversation mm -hmm. and also as someone who's like incredibly disillusioned with uh you know mainstream politics at this point in the u.s um i wonder if you have recommendations for metrics for locals especially small locals like does it matter if we endorse local candidates or state candidates why should we do that spend time and energy on it or is it like better like how do you evaluate if it's better spent um <clears throat> like doing other things and then when you do endorse people, what do you ask of them? Like, what are you, what are you getting? What should we be getting? I know that it can't be like, you can't, you know, have it be like that transparently transactional, but like. So we can come and, and talk with, do a workshop with your group as a short answer. You all represent a number of potential votes. Okay, I went to a, a meet and greet with uh, Jamie McLeod Skinner, my wife and I attended there were five people in a coffee shop. She was just as engaged and just as interested in those five votes as she would be 500, okay? So you then become a single point of access to X number of votes. So yes, you are important. I think the question is like, I don't really see many candidates doing anything that I'm interested in at all. Okay like at any level of politics. Right. I mean, there's like a handful of the labor person that you mentioned before, Adam right. Stevenson. But like most of them actually don't support pro-labor views. So, so like then, what are they yeah. saying to you that's right. making you go, yeah, that person? That's, that's fine. That's why you have a committee uh -huh. and you have enough people to come together and say, hey, this is what I'm interested in. This is the reason why. Uh -huh. Now, I truly believe it needs to be organic. 
Okay. Okay, so again, if it's supporting a candidate or supporting an issue, mm -hmm. you don't want to say all candidates suck, the whole process stinks. Right. But you know, I really think that in the case of farm workers, they should get overtime pay. I could I could also weigh in a little bit. My my old local, uh, close to my heart, in my over five years there, never endorsed a single candidate. Not county commissioner, not school board, uh -huh. not nothing. Right, and so this is this is that wonderful work of like searching out like the soul of your of your union. Right, what we did was a lot of what would be considered political work, uh, doing coalitions, showing up at rallies and protests, a lot of social justice organizing, issue based organizing. Um, if so, it's it's ultimately sort of uh, you know like like Iris said, there's like economies of scale. A state federation of seventeen thousand people has you know that's a lot of folks to um, yeah in, engage in questionnaires. There's a whole committee, so there's more capacity is another question. Um, but really, it's you know what what are you all hoping to accomplish? Some unions out there will find like one candidate that they just go put all of their time, energy, and resources fighting for one person, maybe it's because they're from their old union, maybe it is because they are um, a worker in the same industry. Um, some people take a broader uh, look and say, there's a number of challenged primaries between corporate Dems and progressive Dems, and we wanna tilt the scales in that favor. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no easy answer, but these are all good questions to consider and chew on. And again, they we are willing to come here. out and talk with I have a really quick one more follow up okay. which is do you ever see them move based off of like do you ever move their position candidates yes. who are running based off of giving them a questionnaire being and asking them a question they haven't yes. thought about I okay. have okay I can Quest say that's true questionnaires are like, are like an organizing tool right because like mm -hmm. now they have to do this uh, it's almost like a homework assignment right like now you have to like think about an issue yeah. and, and it's a push survey we, okay. we couch the question and then their choices to answer it Okay, and if they don't choose to answer it, like with Tobias Reed, when we interview him, we zeroed in on the questions he didn't answer in the questionnaire. Okay. And then had to explain to us why he didn't, or now he had an answer. Okay, thank you guys very much okay. for taking the time. All right. Yeah. So, but again, we're more than happy to come out and engage with y'all there.